Anita, you might have to rejoin. I'm so sorry. Would, would somebody else like to start from the facilitators? Because I think Anita hasn't clicked the right audio, perhaps. You can try to rejoin. OK. Um, while Anita is rejoining, my name is Brianti Fernando. I'm the executive director of Euro Asia Pacific, and I'm really happy to be one of the facilitators here. Uh, till Anita joins, I think maybe what I will do is go through some of our, um, uh, go through our main uh, ground rules and virtual safety guidelines. Uh, so if we could have that slide up. Uh, I think we're all now uh, very used to these for uh, Zoom type meetings, uh, but I think we really need to uh, reiterate that we respect one another, that we allow others to participate, so allow everyone to participate. We use welcoming and respect an inclusive language. Uh, recognize that this is a space for an intersectional approach to feminism. Uh, and so we'll make sure that there is no har harassment of any kind, uh, because that will not be tolerated. Uh, this meeting will be recorded, as you heard at the, a little while ago. Uh, you can choose to leave the meeting if you would not like to participate in a recorded uh, meeting. Um, uh, please mute your microphones if you're not speaking, and please honor the confident confidentiality and I statements. Uh, we would wish all participants to speak from their own experiences instead of uh, generalizing, because that will make it um, a much more uh, grounded and fruitful discussion. So welcome to this session, uh, conversation cir circle on feminist uh, and youth uh, movements. Um, I'm just trying to work out whether my co-facilitator Anita is back. Anita, are you back? Yes, I am. Can everyone hear me now? Yes, we can. So over to you, Anita. Okay, thank you very much, um, Priyanti, for that. We will jump right in to the conversation. There are about four of us who would be facilitating this session. I am Anita Graham. We also have Priyanti Fernando, Dirk Davis, and the Honorable Minister Penelope Beckles. So in this short, I would like to hand over to Priyanti Fernando to give her an opening statement, and then we can go ahead to the Honorable Minister Penelope Beckles and their statement. That will round up. Thank you. Priyanti, over to you. Thank you. Uh, you've already heard that I'm the uh, uh, the executive director of the International Women's Rights Action Watch, Asia Pacific. We are based in Malaysia, so it's very early in the morning for me. So uh, please excuse me if I suddenly lose some words or vocabulary. Uh, the International Women's Rights Action Watch, Asia Pacific, or ERO Asia Pacific, is a global South feminist organization working to make the promise of CEDAW the Convention on All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, a reality. Uh, many women's groups and organizations of the women's movement are coming late to this discussion on climate justice, even though climate justice itself uh, impacts heavily uh, and disproportionately on us women in the global south. Our voices have not been heard, and we demand that the conversations around climate uh, include us, especially those of us facing multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. Uh, we've seen some late uh, uh, new reports 
from the IPCC and the IAE and others. And these reports have told us that the increase in emissions in 2021, last year, has completely erased the reduction we experienced in 2020. Uh, and that reduction happened because of the COVID pandemic. In this context, knowing as we do that the world's richest 10% account for over half of all carbon emissions, while those who have contributed the least suffer the most, we demand that uh, for we demand for climate reparations, for addressing loss and damage, and going beyond adaptation. So that's our call uh, from the women's groups and marginalized women's groups that we that rep that uh, we interact with in Euro Asia Pacific. Thank you. Think over to you, Dorothy. Oh, oh I thought it was Minister Beckles. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, hi. Um, okay, so I know in some instances it's good morning. I guess some instances, good afternoon. I am very pleased to participate in this conversation on the feminist and youth movement, um, and more specifically on the theme of achieving gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. My name is Penelope Beckles. I'm the Minister of Housing and Urban Development. I'm a former Minister of the Environment of Trinidad and Tobago. I've served as president of UN Women and I've also served as chair of UNCLOS, United Nations uh, Convention on Ocean and Law of the Sea. And it's my pleasure to participate on this uh, conversation of circles, circles of conversation. That's good. Yeah. Okay, so I would like to say that it is very important. This particular session is very important. Now, I have had the good fortune um, whilst I was president of UN Women to participate very directly um, on some of these very important discussions. Now, whilst there are challenges for the COVID-19 pandemic, I think what this is actually doing is allowing for some creativity under normal conditions. You would have the CSW events. It's been extremely difficult for persons to participate to attend at the United Nations. And what COVID has actually done, I think is given us a little more creativity, given us some more opportunities to be able to discuss, to share our experiences. Um, and the number of the persons today in this particular session under normal circumstances, I may not have had the opportunity to meet with you directly, but COVID has given us that opportunity. And for that, I celebrate and I want to say what a pleasure it is to have the opportunity to meet so many uh, participants from all over the world. So this 66 session, um, and what is interesting, depending on what part of the world you're from, this would actually be the first day uh, of CSW. As someone from a small island developing state, I mean, I'm from a small, uh, a small country, uh, um, an, an island surrounded by water. Uh, and that is why this particular discussion is so important for me as a woman and for the women in Trinidad and Tobago. I know many of you are aware that um, the hurricane season, which is always for us a challenge, and you would remember um, two or three years ago, um, Dominica, Antigua, uh, a couple of years ago, Ivan, in Grenada and what are the consequences of climate change for us? Um, the Prime Minister of Barbados in a recent meeting held, uh, I think it was in Scotland, raised the issue of climate change impact of women, but more particularly for small island developing states. So when you think about living on an island and, and, and as you know, most people that live on islands live on the coast and what is the immediate impact when you have sea level rise or when you have hurricanes. So I, I look forward to, to further discussions 
I, I am aware um, as a, a member of parliament myself, what is the impact of climate change, um, hurricanes, natural disasters on women, even from a very personal perspective, which we often do not discuss. Um, women have, having to go to shelters, um, remain there for pretty long periods, and then the consequences of sexual violence and all other matters related that put women in a, and girls in a particular situation that makes it extremely difficult. I want therefore to say that I look forward to the further discussions I bring to the table. Um, I have been a lawyer as well, um, called to the bar some 34 years ago. So I have been in, in private practice um, and as a member of parliament, I think it's also instructive to me to hear from some of the other countries and some of the other persons contributing, what are some of the suggestions that we have for the improvement of gender equality, especially as it relates to climate change um, for all countries in the world. So thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you. I enjoyed hearing from everyone so far. Uh, I'm Dorothy Davis, and I am the ECASOC designee for the Congressional Black Caucus Institute Global African Diaspora Initiative, or for short, CBCI GADI. CBCI is a non governmental organization and the policy advocacy and leadership training arm of the Congressional Black Caucus. Since receiving ECASOC status in 2017, CBCI Global African Diaspora Initiative is the international arm of CBCI and serves as the platform for the global voices of African Americans at the United Nations and within the global African diaspora. COVID-19 brought visibility to the invisible by publicly and randomly unveiling the tremendous structural and interpersonal health inequities that have existed within the African-American population since slavery in the US and has since spread to include communities of color at large. These health disparities in many cases stem from, excuse me, stem from the environments in which these populations live due to poverty and invisibility. CBCI operates at the intersection of climate justice with socioeconomic, racial, and gender justice. Our mission is to encourage black and brown leaders from low income and all communities to strengthen their political voices by running for office in order to impact the policies affecting them and to bring visibility of these issues to those who are empowered through advocacy. I look forward to our discussion today. Anita, we can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you very much. We can hear you now, yes. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you to everyone who has spoken. Uh, my name is Anita Graham. And I currently work as a research assistant for an organization focused on sexual violence as it relates to girls and young women in West Africa. As a young person from Nigeria, as well as from Africa in general, I can relate to the issues of climate change, particularly because the women and girls in um, Africa are, are one, uh, one of the most people who are most affected 
by climate change as well as COVID-19. And Africa contributes like about 33% of the climate change issues, but we're most affected. And I, I believe that spaces like this are very essential for us to actually discuss what the issues are that we are experiencing, and as well as to figure out what ways that we can move forward as individuals as well as young people. Um, Dorothy, the Honorable Minister, and Priyanki have spoken at length about this issue. I don't think I really need to go over them again. So shortly, we would like to know where everyone is joining us from. And um, we will be using a light pool to do so. So if you would give me a second, I'm going to share my screen and give everyone directions on how to do that. So the link has been posted in the group. And we'd like you to simply tell us where in the world you are joining us from. Hello. Can everyone see my screen here? Yeah? Hello. Hello. Can you see my screen yet? Yeah. yeah I, now I, we can hear you. We couldn't before. Oh, my name is Ellen Gorman, and I'm from New York City. Oh, okay. So I'm going to share my screen now, and you can all see where we're joining in from. So we have people joining us from US, Europe, New York, California, Malaysia, Northern Ireland, UK. We have from Brazil, we have from Jersey, Canada, Halifax in Canada, London. Okay. All right, thank you so much to everyone who is joining us from across the country, or from across the world, rather. So we're going to jump right into the conversation. And um, the very first thing we'd like to talk about is... what the issues are with regards to feminist and youth movements and leadership in relation to COVID-19 and climate change. So we know that there are, there are several issues and we want to hear from you. So I'm going to have this up as well. You can still use the, if you'd rather not speak up in the chat, if you, if you don't want to unmute, you could type your answer in the Mentimeter and it will pop up. So what are the issues that feminist and youth movement and leadership have relating to COVID-19 and climate change? Pri, um, would you like to maybe start off the conversation and have others, maybe have others follow? Hello, hi Priya, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Anita, thank you. All right. So we have Nicole saying, gathering momentum for events and campaigns, okay? Laurie Fisher says, we've had to change our delivery model due to COVID-19 pandemic. 
to all online as opposed to in person, okay? It's very hard to hear you. And when I do hear you, um, I hear would you wind. So it's hard to make out what you're saying. Okay, Free, would you like to take over, please? Okay, let me try. Uh, so what we're looking for, just keep a time on me, Anita, right? Because I can't, uh, let, let me know when we have to change the conversation. Uh, but thank you. Uh, so just about to say that uh, the first question that uh, we are we want to ask in this conversation is um, what are the issues that feminist and youth movements and leadership have relating to COVID-19 and climate change? I think uh, both the minister and the facilitators actually shared some of those at the beginning. So is there anything that uh, people want to add to it. Um, uh, what are the uh, what are the challenges? What what do you want to uh, what what would you like to talk about as the sort of most important challenges that you're facing? What do you feel the U.S. as an industrial country owes to the countries in Africa? Uh, for having been at the forefront of, of releasing all the pollutants. Okay, so you see a responsibility from the US for that? Yes. And is there something, okay, that's, that's an important um, issue. Uh, I also highlighted that because I think in, in, with the groups that I work with, we recognize that uh, most of the, the uh, climate uh, the emissions are from only about 10% of the world. And so there needs to be some accountability for that. Um, okay, uh, uh, somebody, uh, Sutton, there is an uh, issue here that Feminist and youth uh, is a lack. There is a lack of leadership, the lack of women involved in climate change, uh, disruptions to and mental health tolls. Uh, there are so few women at youth and or youth leaders at the table. So climate change conversations happen in a kind of siloed, technical, quote unquote. Uh, space. Uh, what uh, increased participation in decision making? Hey guys, would you like to unmute your mic and say some of these things rather than have me read them out? Hi, um, my name is Kim. So I work okay. for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Uh, before I was here, I was actually working on the tribal level as a technical assistance provider. And one of the things that I agree with is in the chat is that women, women of color, children of color, uh, those who have very intersectional problems, whether if that's violence or access to resources within the indigenous community are not at the table. I feel also that those who are at the table are more likely to come from um, a background of privilege. And one thing that we saw within my own specific indig indigenous community is that during COVID-19, there was a whole bunch of people who were uh, obviously concerned of trying to get access to the vaccine, right? Whereas there was a whole nother population within the indigenous community that did not have running water, that did not have electricity, that did not have uh, plumbing systems within their homes. And uh, of course, this again, pointing to a whole nother avenue within tribal governments and tribal communities that there's a serious lack of infrastructure. And if you connect that again, there's a serious, uh, there's a, failed 
responsibility of the United States government to tribal communities and their and the fail, failure of trust responsibility there that they have not met within indigenous communities. So that's, uh, I'll just add on that because I can go on and on. <laughs> and that's just running, that is just a resource that I feel all human beings and communities should have access to is clean, safe drinking water. And that was one thing that the United States was like running around saying, we don't have access to vaccines or hospitals. Whereas there's a whole nother level of community who didn't even have access to clean water. So um, yeah. Thank you very much. The disparity in access to resources uh, and uh, facilities and services is actually an important issue and continues to be an important issue. Uh, also across borders. So the ability to bring women and particularly, as you say, men facing intersectional uh, discriminations to the table is will also be challenged by what will now happen as uh, things open up, uh, border controls and uh, issues that insist on vaccinations, and boosters and all of that sort of thing as well. So thank you for that. Uh, we can have time for one more intervention if somebody would like to say something before we go to our breakout groups. Yes, I've seen a lot of increased sexual violence and online exploitation of girls uh, with COVID and everyone being at home. The young girls were out of school and at home and online a lot more. So they were being exploited uh, and I don't know, enticed away from their homes and uh, abducted and all kinds of issues that COVID has caused because of people being stuck at home and the women are at home with their, uh, the people that are doing the abuse against them because those people are now out of work and at home as well. And it's made it so much worse. Thank you, yes. I think that's the shadow of pandemic, right? Uh, yeah. The pandemic of violence. Um, sorry, we have two more hands up, so we go quickly to. Where Nick. are you from, Nick? Boy Phillips. Hi, uh, I, I am Nicosi Phillips, political leader to Unity for the People, and also the ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago Youth Will Rise. It's an NGO in Trinidad and Tobago, based in Tobago. Um, one of the things that we would have seen also arising, as we, as I add to you, um, this former speaker saying the rising up sexual abuse against children being one of the cases we have seen also um, sexual abuse in, in regards to women. What we have also seen as an NGO based on the ground is that some of our single mothers did not have the opportunity, they were not fortunate enough to have the technology to do the online schooling with the, um, with the children, because one, they had to juggle work, and then you have to juggle being in the pandemic, not being able to work, and you being a single parent and having to work and no one to monitor the child. You also seen that, well, our government was very swift in trying to get devices for some of the children, but maybe it was not as fast as enough and effective because we also have to look at no, these, some of these parents are not um, online savvy or they're not tech savvy. So that is some of the issues. And I will not reiterate as to what some of the issues that were mentioned before, but I've seen a lot of sexual abuse um, arise in the children, abduction of the women, then we have the online, as, as you mentioned with the, the young girls have been distracted because we have some of these artists you know, they have the online where they have the young girls dancing and performing, you know, in a very lewd way. So I think some of those things that we have to reintroduce into re-educating them as to formulating themselves as young women into young young girls into women. And I think we need to focus on the NGOs having the not only policies, but having the support to bring some of these to the government and to some of our government. So I will leave it right there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, the whole idea of digital, I guess, security and uh, 
is as important as uh, someone's uh, Nicole Parkinson Kelly has mentioned. Also, the issue of uh, digital poverty, right? So the disparity is just as much as we need to protect uh, uh, or provide a safe space for women and girls in the digital space. We also need to recognize that not everybody is still as uh, able to access that digital space. Um, I think there's one hand up, Deborah. Do you want to say something? Yes, um, I'm representing International Women's Convocation, and I'm also a returned Peace Corps volunteer. <clears throat> In my older age, I went to the Philippines, a remote island. And to me, until we get women leaders who are at the table making these decisions, whatever the issue is, that we're not going to progress. And, um, you know, our foreign policy, but it, we really need people at the table. And to me, we need to elect women into politics, into the heads of organizations. Um, and then we can address, there's so many issues, but we need women to understand the issues, not men representing us. So that's all. And youth. Thank you very Sorry. much. Sorry, and youth. I'm a big proponent of youth as well. So, sorry. Thank you so much, Debra. Uh, I think uh, it is time perhaps to go into our breakout groups where we, dis we where we have agreed to, uh, where we have two more questions, continue this conversation around. Anita, do you want to try uh, introducing those questions? We can't, Oops, we can't hear you. Okay, I hope. I hope we can resolve that in in uh, in the breakout groups. But uh, if Anita is okay with it, we will uh, go. Uh, I would just if uh, we could share the screen, which has the two the next two slides, which have the two questions for the breakout groups. Uh, so the first one is: What can we bring to the table? Uh, and the second is, the next question is, what is the way forward? How can we navigate the way forward? Uh, we will discuss these in four groups. Uh, we have a hundred people in, already in, the, in this uh, conversation. So we break out into four groups. I think we would like to have, uh, uh, we had the thought that we would actually divide the groups into two women women's movement groups and two youth groups, and I'm not sure we have sufficient or enough people for that, but I think you can choose. Uh, is that right, organizers, that you can choose which group we want to go into, right? Yes, so we have two sessions uh, for feminist movements and two uh, groups for youth movements. And when I open them, y'all can pick which one you want to join. For the feedback session, uh, we we want to hear which ways uh, have been suggested as ways to, to go forward. And so I believe there's a representative from each breakout session that will highlight the key points made during that session is is that's correct right Anita that's correct okay I can't hear you yes I think that's okay. correct okay yes yeah, so anyone from each of the groups can um indicate to give a feedback about what the way forward was and then for the for everyone who was in the main group we also want someone to do that as well. So over to you, Dorothy. Okay. 
I think I'm going to, I'll start with our group, which was a feminist group. Um, we had several uh, very excellent um, observations and ideas. Um, Brenda from Ontario um, says that, uh, that, that she's benefited from technology in terms of, of learning about the, the um, the experiences of rural women and urban women as a result of the webinars and, and, and other uh, events that she's been able to attend. Um, the meanwhile, Kim has talked about uh, there isn't enough dialogue with intergenerational uh, learning and leadership where um, the cultural and value systems of let's say the older generation is not quite transferred to the younger generation, but also uh, the ways of uh, uh, managing the environment are not shared uh, from one generation to the other. And reverse, that the older generation does not necessarily listen to what the youth are saying, and that there is um, frustration among youth because they are, they feel they've been put on the back burner by the older generation in terms of not being able to speak for themselves and represent themselves. Um, another aspect that was brought out was uh, uh, Nishi Shah also uh, mentioned that um, there was an event she went to at Rutgers where students spoke out and. It was wonderful to hear the different voices, but the problem is that she, she feels that no one is listening. Um, and um, then we had a discussion about uh, how do you get to sit at the table? You know, the table being the proverbial table, right? Do you create tables? Do you, do you um, push forward so that you can be at the table? And there was a discussion that uh, maybe we need to design a new table or several new tables or operate both in terms of getting to the table or having people at the existing table learn more um, or uh, at, at, in addition to creating our own table. Um, the, another interesting idea came up from, uh, or ob observation I'll say came up from Kim, um, the problem with uh, uh, trying to, let's say, educate those who are at the table is that you, you, you have to feel a sense of trust. Um, you have to be able to trust that, that they created a safe space for you to speak and for your reality to be respected. Um, and, um, uh, and also there needs to be a sense of accountability. So now that you're at that table, what, what, how are you accountable to what has been discussed? So that was in the feminist two session, I think it was, breakout session. So who, who wants to represent the youth movement uh, one or two um, in terms of what was said there? Yeah, I'll give the, I'll give the feedback, um, okay? Um, so that, the issue again of um, education, technology, uh, availability of devices um, for young persons, uh, many of them felt that in situations, I'm not gonna go into any individual name because most of them were very similar, but there's the agreement that lack of devices definitely impacted on educational opportunities the recommendations spoke to one-on-one -on -one technology, that is the schools actually having a policy of ensuring that every child has a device um, that would allow to remove the inequalities in terms of educational opportunities. There was also a, a feeling that as a matter of, of a priority that education should be on the agenda um, to ensure that you have that benefit of, of virtual learning. Some persons also felt that there should be more monitoring of the utilization 
of the devices because of persons using the devices for bullying, um, you know, sexual crimes and activities so that there should be much more monitoring. Um, online predators, for example, so that, and one of the suggestions there to address that is the issue of collaboration, have girls talk a lot more, share their experiences, find some sort of space where you would have sort of those discussions, uh, allow for the development of um, leadership in girls. Some, the, another suggestion was the issue of the judicial system. How do you create laws and legislation to deal with predators and persons who are doing online crimes? And of course, most important is the issue of being inclusive. How do you ensure by virtue of the educational policies that no one is left behind. The other issue had to do with, with women um, having to feed children. So you have the issue of poverty, um, issue of increased food prices. So what's the government position on addressing the issue of poverty and the issue of in increased food prices, of course, as a result of COVID because we have the challenges where especially countries that depend heavily on importing um, food, how do, you, how do you address that? Um, also the issue of housing, um, there was a feeling that as a result of that, I mean, you have the impact of young people because clearly if parents have lost their houses and they're homeless, then you now have, you know, homeless families. So again, whilst the government originally would have assisted in terms of payments, um, for housing after a particular period where you have loss of jobs, then you have, um, as you said, an entire homeless family. So some of the suggestions, again, for way forward is the issue of healthcare. Um, some people talked about mental health, but generally um, the access to healthcare, the importance of infrastructure, particularly um, internet, where you could have a device. And if you, for example, at home where, where you are and you don't have, there isn't proper infrastructure, then obviously you don't have the use of the, the devices. Um, and, and, you know, finally, this critical thing of ensuring that all children have access to technology. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Beckles. Yes. Um, Bree, did you have, is there someone from your group that well, like we kind of got, we ran out of time, so I, maybe I should just uh, go. We were a very small group, uh, I think just five people. Uh, so most of the sisters were from the US and there was one uh, from Jersey and then there was myself. Uh, and I think one of the things that we were very, uh, we I think we agreed on was that we all have voice, but it's how to, and that's what we bring to the table. But the question is, how do we uh, get there? We can't wait for them to call us or them to provide uh, the situation, uh, to improve the situation for us, whoever they might be. Uh, so, uh, we, and we can't assume that our voices are being heard uh, by the people that make decisions and the legislators, right? Uh, so the question is, uh, so that uh, that was a big issue that uh, we've all agreed on. We also felt that there was an, uh, this issue that has been brought up in your group and Minister Beckel's group that um, the uh, technology is, uh, is there, there are divides in the technology, very strong for me and my, my sisters in, in Asia, but I think it was interesting to see that computers at the table is an issue also in communities in the US. Uh, and so bringing computers to the table, facilitating this kind of engagement on these platforms that we didn't have access to earlier is also an important uh, way forward, I guess, or something that we have to um, think about, uh, while at the same time, uh, addressing online exploitation, both sexual exploitation and other kinds of online exploitation of children and women. Um, 
one of the, but uh, so we, we were all a little bit frustrated at the, at the, at whether, uh, to wonder whether we were actually making progress because these are issues we've been discussing for a while. Uh, and, uh, but we agreed that we need to keep at it. We need to keep uh, uh, making sure, uh, we need to keep at it. We need to go where our legislators are and the, the big push forward would be if more of us, more of us women run for office. So that was really, I think, some of the things that uh, came from our group. I hope somebody will put in the chat if I have, if I have missed anything. Thank you. Thank you, Pri. Anita, from your group. Um, I think I will just, because um, on time, just also just give the, uh, um, one of the things that we highlighted that we could bring to the table would be um, our individual perspectives about the issues on ground. We could also bring um, the voices of people who are most affected, as well as bringing the people who are most affected to the table. We can bring in more activities to sensitize our leaders about the issues. And um, one of the things that would be, we can, um, one of the things we want to see as the way forward would be things like um, gender segregated data that can help us show what's working and uh, where we need more efforts, things like gender sensitive laws, um, giving more opportunities for women and young people to participate in leadership. Um, we also talked about mentorship for young women and girls and ensuring that uh, we have policies that do not discriminate against women and girls in public spaces. So I think that we can all agree that, you know, we, we really want more women, more girls to become um, involved in both the decision making processes as well as, you know, the, as well as the activism and sure that everybody become more educated about the issues and we can be able, we will be able to chart a better way forward as a result. Thank you. Okay. So I want to thank everyone for their input and for providing these different ways that we can move forward. The main thing seems to be an underlying theme of everyone. It seems to get more women in positions of leadership and some kind of a pipeline so that girls can, can also move towards those steps. I want to thank um, everyone uh, for their participation. And I believe this is recorded. So therefore, you can also gain access to it and use some of these ideas in other conversations that you may have or as a, a catalyst to create opportunities for um, creating solutions uh, or implementing solutions. Um, so I want to turn it, I guess I turn it over to Anita because she started, she started to, to conclude it. Um, and I want to thank you for the opportunity for, for being here. I really uh, enjoyed listening to everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, Dorothy. So we have about um, five more minutes. So if there's anything anyone would like to add, um, you could go ahead and do so. And then at, um, in five minutes, the Honorable Minister would um, be rounding us up and we would be closing this conversation circle. So we have five minutes for anyone who would want to add anything. Just, could you just raise your hands up and we can uh, have this in an orderly manner. Thank you. Do we have anyone who would want to say something? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Khalida Salimi and I represent Pakistan. And I, first of all, I apologize this time that I 
I couldn't manage to see the exact time, so I, I missed most of the uh, conversation. But later I'll be watching the recording. So. Um, can I say something, Anita? I think you I should agree. go ahead, you know, because we are just, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to thank Alida for coming in from Pakistan. Uh, one of the things that uh, the digital space one of the challenges of the digital space is timing. So I am uh, awake at, uh, I mean, this timing is really not a timing where you can have representation from Asia or uh, maybe Pacific, yes, but not from Asia. So it's, uh, it, it, uh, that is one of the challenges of digital spaces. And I think we need to recognize that. So thank you, Kalida, for waking up this early and being here. Actually, I was I was uh, waiting, 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 and suddenly I went to sleep, and I got up and I said, "Oh my goodness, I'm going to miss it." But thank you. Thank you very much, Kalida. Um, Sheila, you have your hand up. Would you like yes. to say something? Yes. Yes, I'd like to say something, and that is the protection of our young women since they are doing a lot of online stuff that parents don't necessarily, their safety is a concern. I put in the chat a uh, cybercivilrights.org to report if they have any issues with regard to bullying, uh, sexual assault or in improper communication with young women. I think that law, because right now there are no laws that really protect our children against predators online. And I think that that's something that we really need to focus on. So that's all I wanted to say. I did put it in the chat. I put it in just now again. And I think that um, it's something, a resource that is available for young people. And it's something that we need to tighten up. I completely agree. And, and seeing even older men um, mm. just getting these young girls online and they're not aware of it until it's too late. It's really a problem. Yeah, Thank for you, Sheila and um, um, Lida, over to you, um, Honorable Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I say something because I just wanted to contribute that Pakistan government has also put in place the um, uh, laws to protect uh, young children from cyber crimes. And uh, now we are working on the effective implementation of the laws. Mm -hmm. That's cool. um, thank you both. Yeah, we really don't have more time for any more responses. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has responded so far. Um, we would have to going to the closure right now. So over to you, Honorable Minister. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anita. I'll be very brief because I know we've run out of time, but I just want to say that as the world lives, learns to live with COVID-19, there must be a plan to put gender equality, social justice, and sustainability at the center of the recovery um, and transformation. One of the most important things about this session is the recognition that the NGO movement is responsible for global policy, uh, influencing global policy as it relates to these issues that we are discussing. So I just want to encourage everyone at the, who attended to, to give yourselves uh, the credit that you deserve in recognition of the role and function of the NGO movement, which isn't always heralded for the, the work that you do in terms of influence, influencing policies and programs of government. One final thing um, from our group that I forgot was the issue be between virtual and reality. Um, someone mentioned that a young guy wanted to play basketball and he was actually, his thought of playing basketball was doing it virtually. 
So, so we may forget that this concept of the virtual platform can actually cause some people to believe that the virtual platform is reality. So once again, thank you very much, Anita. Thank you so much, um, um, Dorothy. Um, Kalida, um, I'm sorry that um, you, know, you sort of fell asleep. Um, we do understand that because of the time difference, all of us, it's morning, it's night, it's afternoon for some of us. Um, so to all my sisters and those brothers on the platform, Anita, over back to you. Again, it was my pleasure to facilitate this session. Be safe, everyone. Don't forget COVID is still alive and well. Anita? Thank you very much, Minister. So we've come to the end of the session. And I really like to um, thank the Honorable Minister Penelope Beckles, Priyanka Fernando, um, as well as um, as well as Gerald Davis for co-facilitating the session. It has been an awesome um, session. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And we hope that you continue to join in the conversations throughout CSW. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, Priya. Bye-bye. Great.